Um, hello, this is Dr. Thomas Aller, um, recording live from the scene of the International Myopia Conference here in Tokyo, Japan. We tried to do this little interview outdoors, but the trains and the planes and the helicopters intruded. So now we're lurking in a hallway, um, uh, telling you about uh, Myopia Care's newest addition to their clinical tools, and that is an adaptation of my Myopia app. And uh, Myapia was conceived as a tool for practitioners mainly to help them understand what uh, they can expect as far as myopia progression in kids that are treated with conventional methods, that is, methods that are not attempting to slow down myopia, and uh, then uh, to visualize and to show the parents what would happen, what may happen, if we intervene with various methods that the doctor may choose. Uh, that have known or suspected um, levels of myopia control effects. So you can select from, um, you know, bifocal glasses, executive um, uh, bifocals, um, you know, uh, atropine, ortho -K, multifocal contact lenses, um, commercially available, customized, and in the tool, uh, and both tools are averages, uh, just estimates of what uh, the literature suggests one can expect from those uh, treatments, uh, but the practitioner is invited to uh, insert their own um, expectations for um, what kind of uh, percentage effects they might get with their treatments uh, based on their own reading of the literature or uh, when the literature gets updated, like at these conferences, um, or for an individual patient, what they, what they think they might expect. So you take those uh, numbers, those percentages, and you input for the patient their age and their initial prescription. And then uh, it uses, a, a, as its projection tool, um, a, uh, a formula from a published study uh, from uh, Admaja Sankari Derg and others at the Brian Holden Vision Institute, uh, looking at uh, the natural rate of progression among uh, young Chinese children in uh, urban southern China. Uh, it's a very large population, and that formula forms a basis for the um, uh, progression curve. Now, that is expected to be a fairly rapidly progressing population, so we have in our tool an ability to adjust that. And, um, and then in the new iteration of myopia care, there's also a, uh, an ability to input uh, risk factors and have the risk factors uh, adjust uh, the expectations from the tool. In any event, however you generate a curve, it invariably will show a decay over time with age, which is very valuable uh, because we know that that happens. And so, uh, and also the, the key feature of these tools, you can debate how predictable things really are uh, based on clinical trials. But um, what it does illustrate is every treatment shown, no matter what percentage um, control effect you might input or you might anticipate with your treatment, uh, every treatment shows that the prediction is that the child will be more myopic in the next year. Um, and so that helps to uh, assure the parent that while you're making very every attempt to slow myopia, uh, that it's reasonable to assume that there will be some increase in myopia in the next year. And uh, these parents, a lot of times, uh, in my area particularly, very well informed, uh, they read the literature, and they know about microns, uh, they know about diopters, and uh, even if the child goes from a diopter in a quarter of the year before, and under your treatment increases at a quarter diopter in the next year, uh, parents may still say, oh my god, a quarter of a doctor and my little darling's still getting worse, uh, but you can show with curves that um, both for the expected curve, uh, if there were no intervention, and even under the most aggressive uh, predictions uh, from the literature with your intervention, um, you're still anticipating at least some growth uh, of the eye and some increase in myopia. So it's a useful tool to um, not only explain to parents what to expect, what are reasonable expectations, and, and also for the practitioner, for them to judge whether they're achieving what the clinical trials or average clinical trial results suggest. And if you're underperforming, 
uh, to the expectation for that particular treatment, then uh, as a clinician, you can always change your treatment. You can, um, you can add atropine, for instance, and a lot of studies looking at combination atropine with ortho K, the results are starting to trickle out. But it's reasonable to assume that if you do a combination treatment, there are multiple reasons why you might expect to have better outcomes. Um, are there clinical trials to show, for instance, that if we change the zone size on a multifocal contact or we increase the ad power, that we're going to have predictable, definable outcomes? Not that I'm aware of. I have plenty of cases that suggest to me as a clinician that's the case, and I have some papers uh, planned for that. But uh, practitioners are free to use their, uh, use their knowledge and use uh, uh, rational thought to uh, conclude that uh, if they're not hitting their treatment goals, they need to do something else. And that's one vital difference, I think, between clinical practice and clinical trials. We're in a clinical trial, whatever your treatment is at the beginning of the study, three years later, you're still restricted to use that treatment, whether you had effectiveness or not. But in clinical practice, patients want you to be their doctor, not their scientist. And uh, so this tool helps you to uh, judge whether you need to take a different approach.